Well, I wonder if you heard this story recently. There was a UC Davis student, and she was uh, walking across campus and noticed a little crumpled piece of paper on the sidewalk, and she picked it up and was going to throw it away. But she picked it up, she noticed it was a lottery ticket, so took it back to her apartment, only to discover that it was a winning lottery ticket. And after she redeemed the ticket, paid all her taxes, um, she took home over a million dollars, and so the uh, campus newspaper sent uh, a student reporter over to interview her, and naturally, one of the first questions she asks is, what are you going to do with all this money? And so the UC Davis student said, well, I'll probably use it to pay off my student loans. And then the reporter followed up by asking her, what about the rest? And the student said, well, I'm sure I'll pay that all off eventually, some point. Ha, 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 That's one of the oldest jokes. It didn't really happen at UC Davis. I just thought I'd an infuse a little local interest. But uh, student loans, right, is a hot topic these days. In fact, just this Friday in the news, they were all abuzz because there were reports that President Biden was planning to cancel $10,000 worth of student loan debt for every individual making less than $150,000 a year or every household making less than $300,000 a year. So, going to wave the magic wand and voila, it will be gone. Uh, student loan debt, though, is not even close to the only debt problem we have in our country. Right? U.S. corporate debt in 2022 stands at around $22 trillion. U.S. national debt is reported to be around $30.5 trillion. U.S. consumer debt is around $4.5 trillion. And for those of us lowly people here, we cannot comprehend the number trillion. We really cannot. It's like a, it's like a gazillion. We might as well say it. A cabillion. Um, it's a lot. You remember how, though, in the book of Deuteronomy, we have been repeating week after week after week that the commands of the Lord, the law of the Lord that he gave to his people through Moses on Mount Sinai, that these laws were not only were they not a burden to his people, but they were actually his special blessing that he had given to his chosen people. Does that sound familiar to any of you? These laws are a blessing. Well, even if you haven't been with us for any of our sermons in Deuteronomy, I'm going to read Deuteronomy chapter 15, and I want you, as I read it, to take note of how many times Moses tells the people that in obedience or by obedience or through obedience, they will be blessed. Listen as I read Deuteronomy chapter 15. We'll get back to the, the, the debt in a minute. Don't worry. I've got a solution. Deuteronomy chapter 15. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, because the Lord's release has been proclaimed. Of a foreigner you may exact it, but whatever is yours with your brother, your hand shall release. But there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandment that I command you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he promised you, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And you shall rule over many nations, but they shall not rule over you. If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend to him sufficient for his needs, whatever it may be. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, The seventh year, the year of release, is near. And your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing. 
and he cry to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him. Because of this, the Lord will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, he shall serve you for six years, and in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, and out of your wine press. As the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this day, if he says to you, I will not go from you because he loves you and your household since he is well off with you, then you shall take an awl and put it through his ear into the door and he shall be your slave forever. And your female slave, you shall do the same. It shall not seem hard to you when you let him go free. For half the cost a hired worker, he has served you six years. So the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. All the firstborn males that are born of your herd and flock you shall dedicate to the Lord your God. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You shall eat it, you and your household, before the Lord your God, year by year, at the place that the Lord will choose. But if it has any blemish, if it is lame or blind, or has any serious uh, blemish whatsoever, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. You shall eat it within your towns. The unclean and the clean alike may eat it as though it were a gazelle or deer. Only you shall not eat its blood. You shall pour it out on the ground like water. So, many times there, Moses tells the people that you will be blessed if you obey this commandment. So the, the issue at hand with this Sabbath year that Moses is describing to the people is the question, do you trust God enough to obey him? And if you do, you will be pleasantly surprised. You will be blessed. In fact, what we have here is essentially three commands to let things go. And if you let go of them, if you open up your hands and let them go, what you will find is rather than you being uh, impoverished or lacking, you will actually be blessed. So let's look at what we are supposed to let go of, or what they were supposed to let go of, and then ask the question, does this apply to us? Do these old covenant commands apply to us under the new covenant? Leroy just talked about how when we celebrate communion, we are celebrating the blood and body of Christ as a part of the new covenant. So, the first thing we're supposed to let go of is let go of what you are owed. Verses 1 through 11. There's this Sabbath year that is described here. And it's the seventh year. Every seventh year is supposed to be, just like every seventh day of the week, it's supposed to be a day of rest. Every seventh year is supposed to be a day of rest. And so it's modeled after the days of creation. It is an essentially an extension of the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And if you remember, there's more information given when that commandment is given. And it's tied back to the days of creation. Because God created everything in six days and on the seventh day he rested so Moses tells the people as he comes down from Mount Sinai and gives them the Ten Commandments, actually God tells them through Moses, that that seventh day is supposed to be set aside as holy to the Lord. It's supposed to be a day of rest. Well, as it turns out, there's also supposed to be a seventh year, a Sabbath year. And if you look in Exodus chapter 23, verses 10 and 11, and Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 through 7, the focus is, has to do with our, the, the people of Israel, when they enter the land, their fields. They were supposed to let the fields rest, not plant them, not harvest them, let the fields rest. And the flocks, they're supposed to let the flocks rest. 
And, and so it had this idea of um, you're not supposed to work the land or work your flocks, just let them rest. Well, in the same way, what we find in Deuteronomy chapter 15, in the same way they were not to let their fields be worked and they were supposed to rest them on the seventh year, they were also supposed to cancel debts that were owed to them. In, uh, in my translation, I'm reading from the ESV, it says in verse 1, at the end of every seventh year, you shall grant a release. Depending on what translation you have, you might have something else. But the word literally means to let fall or let drop. Imagine that you have something in your hand and you're holding on to it and you open up your hand and turn it over. What's going to happen? It's going to fall to the ground. So the picture that's being made is this is the debt that you have. You're holding it in your hand and somebody owes you on this debt. On the seventh year, you open your hand and you turn it over and you let it drop. It's a fairly simple instruction. If you have loaned money, food, property, seed for planting, whatever it is, when the Sabbath year comes, you let it drop. There's an interpretive issue here, though. Not everybody agrees on the extension to which this release is supposed to be Made. Some people say it's just a pause. You pause for that one year, and then at the end of the seventh year, well, then you, that person is supposed to resume paying the debt. And the, the reason uh, people who argue for this understanding has to do with the fact that the Sabbath year is a year that we let our fields rest and our flocks rest, and so it would be sort of unusually cruel to expect people to continue paying on their debts in a year that they were, in essence, not allowed to sort of bring in much by way of income because they were letting their fields and flocks rest. On the other side of it, the people who are in favor of a total release, that on the seventh year you let the remainder of the debt drop, has to do in part with the understanding of what is said later on in chapter 15 about lending to poor people, to the poor. Um, if you go to verse 7, if one of your brothers should come, become poor in any of your towns, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against the poor brother. You're supposed to still lend to them. And as he goes on to say, he's like, you're not supposed to think in your heart, oh, it, we're not very far off from this seventh year. And so if I'm loaning to this poor person... And next year is the seventh year. Well, my, lent, my loan essentially turns into a gift at that point. Because he's only got a few months he's going to be able to pay on this debt until I have to release it. And I'm of the understanding that the full release on the seventh year is the proper understanding of it. Because of what is said specifically in this context. As it relates to the poor person. There's this temptation that might lurk in our minds that would say, well, if I loan this money, I can pretty much be guaranteed I'm not getting much of it back. So therefore, I'm just not going to loan it to them and let them continue to wallow in their poverty. And what God says through Moses is, that's not even supposed to enter into your mind. You're supposed to trust me and do what is right What's so amazing is the claim that Moses makes in this passage. The claim that Moses makes in this passage is that if you live this way, if when you lend to people, now contextually he's clear that these laws apply specifically when you lend to other Israelites. If you lend to somebody outside of Israel, a foreigner, you can continue to collect debt from them on the seventh year. So this, there is, it's not a, a full uh, sort of unrestrained uh, release of everything. It specifically has to do with your fellow countrymen. But with that being said, the implication is, number one, he says, there will be no poor among you if you live this way. You will essentially eliminate poverty 
within your borders. You will be blessed if you obey this commandment. Now, obviously, this is the idealized uh, ultimate outcome of this, because later in the chapter, he says, verse 11, there will never cease to be poor in the land. It's, you're always going to have opportunity to do this because nobody's going to do this properly. He makes an even crazier implication that not only if you do this will there be no poor among you, but you will, as a nation, be so wealthy that you will lend to other nations, uh, but you won't need to borrow from them. You will rule over them, but they will not rule over us. It would seem to us that if the Israelites went around forgiving debts all the time, that the nation would not be propelled into wealth and prosperity, that she would be reduced to poverty pretty quickly. Because our thought is, well, everybody's just going to take advantage of that, right? We're all just going to go around being lazy and not working and just let everybody else prop us up knowing that the seventh year is coming and it's all just going to be a wash then. Well, the need to borrow in an agrarian culture, uh, at least at this time, there were people that would manipulate it, but it was more moved by ec uh, environmental factors. Crop failure, herds that don't reproduce. It wasn't that there were these wild speculative risks that were be under, being undertaken or just simple wastefulness that yes there we're talking about people are still sinners back then and so it isn't that their sinful uh, tendencies just were completely gone there were still people that behaved that way but as a general rule the problems arise when um, their sources of income were dried up because of things like crop failure or herd failure. Have you, ever, have you ever read any of the Little House on the Prairie books or watched the TV shows? It pretty much happened all the time to them in those books, you know. Uh, pa, Charles Ingalls, just every time it seemed like they were going to have a bumper crop or their cattle were just going to be producing tons of milk or whatever it was he was going to finally be able to get ahead in life and their family was going to he was going to be able to provide for him well there would be a hailstorm that would destroy the whole crop or crows would come and eat all the grain or there would be a, a blizzard late in the spring and just destroy it just it happened all the time and so it seemed like he just could never get ahead because you know, it was one thing after the other, and it was completely out of his control, and he was a hard-working man trying to provide for his family out there on the, you know, in the western front, not the western front of Europe, but the western frontier. Um, and it just, ah, he was always sort of perpetually frustrated because of that. Well, the seven-year cycle of debt release would enable people like Charles Ingalls or whoever, who found themselves in hardship because of a crop failure or whatever, that they would be able to be relieved of that burden within a known window of time because there was this seven-year loop that the nation would be cycling through over and over again. And so the way in which this would ensure uh, the prosperity of the nation of Israel, rather than propelling it into poverty, was helping to eliminate poverty by spreading the burden of economic loss among the people rather than concentrating it on one or two individuals. And if you uh, know anything about economics, poverty typically begets poverty. And so it would uh, help people to not get caught in that cycle of generational poverty. So, is there any real application for we New Covenant believers for this Old Covenant command? Is, is there anything that we can take away? I mean, when we go to the New Testament, we don't really see anything about a Sabbath year there, a, a releasing of debt for, from people. We don't see that. 
What would you say is another term, though, for debt release? Forgiveness. So we do find forgiveness a lot in the New Testament, don't we? The, the biblical principle for, of forgiveness is illustrated, I think, quite clearly in this Sabbath year command. And in fact, we can go to Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, after the disciples have asked him, uh, well, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, but we know that when he asked them to teach us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer, it says to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I think forgiveness, at least for me, is one of the hardest things to do as a Christian. And oftentimes, I think it's because in my mind, I conjure up the same type of objections that I would raise to debt forgiveness. I would say things like, well, they won't learn their lesson. I can't forgive them because it means they're going to get away with it. I can't forgive somebody because they don't deserve it. I can't forgive somebody because... They just need to shoulder the burden of their own, in, my, in this case, sin, but we could say the, their own economic situation. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's the only way you're going to figure things out. There's, I think, uh, some fairly clear parallels here. The debt forgiveness here in Deuteronomy chapter 15 and the, the command to forgive one another that we find repeated over and over and over again in the New Testament. In fact, forgiveness, we could even drill it all the way down to the gospel. Forgiveness is a gospel issue, isn't it? I mean, from a human perspective, it is the gospel issue. It is the solution to our greatest need, which is uh, a solution to the problem of our sin. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, you find this. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God, the Father, through his grace and mercy, by the work of Jesus Christ, his sinless life, his death on the cross for uh, us as a substitute for our sins and his resurrection has provided for us the means by which we can have our sins forgiven. We have, uh, as David makes clear in his confession of his sin in Psalm 51, we have sinned against God. That's who our sin is against. So God is essentially holding this debt in his hands, and that if he uh, was so inclined, he could demand as justice full and complete payment for that debt. Uh, but if you understand anything, uh, you need to understand this, that we as finite individuals who owe a debt against an infinite God can never fully repay that. And so the only way for there to be satisfaction of that debt is if at some point God is able to open up his hand and let it go. And he's able to do that and maintain his justice by not merely letting it go, but by transferring it to Jesus Christ and letting Jesus Christ pay that debt. Now, if we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 15... And we think specifically about the forgiveness of financial or economic debt. There are so many questions that arise in our minds. And in fact, many of us have probably already compiled a list of objections as to why this should not apply to us. Why we shouldn't have to forgive debts people owe us. You don't have to raise your hand or nod your head if that's you. But I know I start doing that when I read it. I'm going to do something. You're not going to like it. But 
I'm not going to try and resolve any of those tensions for you this morning. I'm going to let you take some time to consider what Moses has said to these people before you rush off to your list about this is all the reasons why we shouldn't have to do this today. I want you to just take this at face value. For what Moses is saying, they were supposed to do every seventh year as a part of their rest from their labors. Part of that was providing a way for people to have release from these burdens of economic debt. So the first command to let go in order for God to bless them was to let go of what they were owed. The second one, maybe this is even harder for us, let go of what is fair. Verses 8 or verses 12 through 18. Let go of what's fair. Verses 12 through 18 talks about slavery, which makes us very uncomfortable. And when we talk about slavery in the Old Testament, though, we have to resist the urge to automatically frame it in the terms of uh, chattel slavery, the owning of people as property, which is what we are most familiar with. It's not what is being talked about here. Given that we're talking about fellow Israelites in the prior context is releasing someone from their debts, it is most logical in the way this is described also to conclude that we're talking about what's called debt slavery. Now what debt slavery is, is when an individual owes a debt that they are unable to pay, that they are uh, able to be relieved of that debt by, for a period of time, uh, working as a slave to that person as a means of paying off their debt. Now, believe it or not, this was a part of uh, the uh, Seinfeld sitcom. In the Seinfeld sitcom, part of that was uh, one of the seasons Jerry was pitching a pilot to NBC and the, the plot of the pilot they were pitching was that Jerry got uh, in a car accident with somebody and the individual didn't have insurance and when able, was unable to pay for the car repairs. So the judge uh, decreed that this individual was going to serve as Jerry's butler. And that was supposed to be humorous, you know. And, but believe it or not, that was a real thing. It was really how people were able to pay off their debts. Under Mosaic law, Hebrew, these types of Hebrews had, these slaves had rights. And one of those rights is what we call the right of manumission. They were limited in how long they could serve as a slave, irrespective of the size of the debt. Six years was the limit. Now these years did not, uh, the cycle of years didn't overlap the Sabbath year. It just, when, whenever they started to serve, they had six years, and after the sixth year, they were done. Whatever the debt was, it was considered paid off. This is what Moses is saying. You ha there is a term limit to paying off your debts this way. Now, once again, the person who is being paid their debt this way might say, well, that's not fair. They owe me more than they can possibly work in six years. But what Moses would say is, no, that's perfectly fair. If you notice also how they're supposed to dismiss these slaves that have been serving to pay off these debts. It says, when you let your slave go, this is in verse 13, you shall not let him go empty-handed. In fact, you shall furnish him liberally out of your flock and out of your threshing floor and out of your wine press. In other words, when you let this individual go, you're going to set them up for success. You're not going to push them out the door and push them right into poverty, right back into a situation 
where they will either have to borrow against something and pay it back or borrow and then work for another six years as someone else's slaves. You're going to push them back out into the world with everything they need in order to thrive. And once again, you might say, well, that's not fair. They owed me all this to begin with. Why should I take from my flocks and from my, my barns and from my wine press and just give them all this stuff? And Moses says, don't, don't worry about it. They just worked for you for six years for less than half the price you would have had to pay if you would have hired a servant. You got a great deal. They worked off the debt. Maybe not all of it, but a good chunk of it. And you got this very deeply discounted labor in return. And don't pound your fist and say, well, this isn't fair. I deserve more. There was an exception. If, if somebody wanted to stay on as a slave, and we might instantly think, well, why in the world would anyone want to do that? Well, there's really two reasons somebody would do that. One would be if the master was a kind and generous individual and the enslaved person realized that even as a free man, they were unlike, unlikely to have it as good as they had it living in this person's household as their slave. This is the point uh, in the parable of the prodigal son. If you remember, when he's in the pigsty, sort of at very rock bottom, eating the food that pigs eat, literally with nothing, and not a roof over his head, maybe not even clothes on his back. You remember, he comes to his senses, and what does he think? He says, well, even the slaves in my father's house have it pretty good. Maybe I'll just go back and ask my father if he will let me serve as a slave in his household. Once again, this is not the type of slavery that we are familiar with. Now, the other reason why somebody might want to continue on is if in their time in this household, they, uh, they got shot by Cupid's arrow and fell in love with another slave and got married. And so, uh, as this person reaches the time of their freedom, the person they're married to is still... Um, under this uh, bondage that they can elect to remain a slave so that they can stay with their, with their keep the family together. Uh, but in such circumstances, they were supposed to make the relationship permanent by piercing the slave's ear. Now, this is very interesting. One, to, one of these cultural things, you're supposed to take an awl and pierce the ear, which makes sense. You know, you've got to pierce it with something but you pierce it to the door. And so you stick it through the ear and then punch it in the door too. And it sort of symbolized that you were attached to that household. We probably wouldn't do it the same way today, but that's how they did it then. Showed that they were attached to that house. So either way, when the time of debt, uh, time to release them of this debt they were supposed to make sure that the slave, or now former slave, was well cared for. And once again, Moses has to get down to motives of the heart. The key to both of these instructions, really, the, the letting go of what you are owed and letting go of what you uh, believe to be fair is that you're, in either situation, you're supposed to do it, but you're not to let your heart begrudge you. You, you don't do it with this sense of bitterness or, or resentment or that I'm entitled to something different and God's making me do this against my will. No, God has blessed us. And through these acts of letting go, he is continuing to make his blessing known, not only to the one who's being let go, but to those who are being uh, released from their debt or their enslavement. And what is the reminder? It should be no surprise to us. The reminder goes back to Egypt. Their deliverance 
from slavery. You shall not begrudge this because the Lord your God redeemed you when you were slaves in Egypt. Turn over to Matthew chapter 18. Once again, a strange concept to us because I don't believe it's that we even have the option of enslaving people in order to pay off debts. In fact, we have laws to keep that from happening. So this might seem very strange to us. But I want you to consider what is discussed in Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. So once again, I'm making the jump between this type of letting go and forgiveness. But I think you're going to find out that we are in good company when we make this jump. Because you'll find that Jesus makes the same connection as well. So he says, Jesus just said, I do not say seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And he began to settle. One was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he, since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold, while his wife and children and all that he had, and payment, or with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him his debt. He opened up his hand, and he let it go. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. And he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servant saw that what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So Jesus makes the exact same connection. Uh, forgiveness, forgiveness of sins with the forgiveness of financial debt. And he makes it clear the same thing that the debt of forgiveness that God has demonstrated to sinners is an unpayable debt. 10,000 talents is more money than this person could ever repay in his entire life, or even many lifetimes. And yet, the master forgave him. And so, in turn, when he had the opportunity to forgive a very small debt, the understanding would be that he should know just how much mercy has been shown to him, that he would be willing to, in kind, show mercy to this other individual. When you think about uh, the gospel and what God has done for us through Christ Jesus, you have to understand that when we talk about God forgiving us our sins, we are talking about being forgiven a debt that is impossible for us to pay. It, it is an infinite debt. How, how much do you have if you cut infinity in half? You still have infinity, right? So let's say we could pay off half our debt. 
we would still have an infinite debt to pay. That is how impossible it would be. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, Scripture says, through Jesus Christ, has given us the forgiveness of sins for every person who believes. If you understand that, you men and women, should be the kind of people who are eager to forgive. Open your hand and let it go. The Bible gives us instructions on forgiveness. So it isn't like it just says, just go out and do it. You can find that out. But but as a principle, we are supposed to be the kind of people who are ready, willing, and eager to forgive. Let go of what you think is fair. Last one is letting go of what you prize. It's a little different from the other two. It kind of ties back into the previous chapter, chapter 14. Um, We're at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 14. Uh, Moses gives instructions about offering up the first fruits and the firstborn animal. So here at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 15, there's instructions given for offering up this firstborn animal. And it's a, a sacrifice to the Lord. It's something that's supposed to be done every year. And once again, when Moses talks about this firstborn, you can't get away from thinking about Egypt. That's how they were delivered, right? This, their firstborn was spared by putting the blood on their doorpost from an animal that was without spot or blemish. So every year, the firstborn males had to be offered to the Lord. What is a firstborn male? The firstborn male refers to every calf that or baby lamb, whatever a baby boy lamb is called, a ewe, I guess, I don't know. Um, uh, Every ewe and calf that's born in an animal's bearing life, the first one. So every year, every male born to an animal for the first time in its life, it doesn't mean the first animal born that year from the whole herd, had to be sacrificed to the Lord. But the only exception was it couldn't be defective in any way. When you offered it to the Lord, it was to be a dedication to him. They did get to eat it, though. We talked about this last week. It wasn't like they were just completely giving it up. They got to benefit from it in some way. So you might think, well, then how is this a sacrifice? We're letting this go. Well, the sacrifice was that you let go of the ability to pick and choose which animal you were offering and which ones you would keep. I mean, left to our own choice, we would keep the strongest, healthiest animals that were going to be able to go on and reproduce so that as the flocks grew, they would also grow stronger and healthier. And we would give up sort of the weak ones, the ones that kind of were, you know didn't have the right color eyes or didn't quite look right or rooted for the wrong baseball team or something like that, we would give them up. We'd sacrifice the weak and defective. If any of you watched uh, All Creatures Great and Small, Chaz and Mary Jo turned turned us on to that. Um, It's kind of a cute little show about a country vet in England. Um, And there's, we were watching an episode not that long ago where they had the town fair and in the fair, uh, one of the friends of the, this country vet, they were going to auction off their bull for sale at the fair. And they wanted the vet to vouch for this bull. And he was sort of stricken with this because as he examined the bull, he found some defects in it. And so his integrity wouldn't let him lie about this bull, that he had found some swelling in it and some things that made it maybe not quite what the person who was going to buy it had, um, had maybe thought they were going to be getting. 
Well, let's imagine that we're now in, uh, we're in the promised land now after Joshua has led the people through conquest, and we've got this bull, but we can't sacrifice it to the Lord either. We can't say, well, he's kind of this gimpy bull, not really going to do much for the herd, so let's go and sacrifice it to the Lord. Can't do that. You, you, you've got to give up your very best, or at least the thing that comes out first, whatever it is, as long as it's not got any blemishes. That's what you've got to give to the Lord. And I think we understand the tension of this all too well also. We know that we are supposed to give to the Lord and to His work, but so often we want to give to the Lord kind of how we give to the rummage sale. We give the stuff we already kind of want to get rid of. You know, you're not going out and buying a brand new couch and then bringing it into the room and saying, I mean, like, all right, here's the couch I'm donating. Just spent 1500 bucks on it. want you guys to see if you can get 20 you know. That's not what we do. It's got the, the cat has clawed on it, or there's a coffee stain on the thing. The cushions are all frayed. That's the one we want to give. We kind of want to give to God the same way. We give from our leftovers. We give from the stuff we already wish we could get rid of. And that's not what God wants, and that's certainly not what God deserves. If we understand the kind of forgiveness we've been shown. I heard a song not that long ago called One and Only by a singer named Jess Ray. And the first line of the verse is this. Oh, what misery living as a slave to things in a cave with all your dreams, so afraid that you will lose your little darlings. And so often, that's, this is our life that we're afraid that if we give it up to God, these are my little treasures. These are my little knickknacks. This is my little life. This is my little stuff. I can only give the stuff to God that I really don't want anyway. That's not how it's supposed to be. And when we cling to those things, the point of that song is that it's called one and only because the point is that God gave up his one and only son. He gave that up for us. Can't we give up our treasures in the pursuit of serving God and glorifying him? It should be no real sacrifice to let go of our best, our best time, our best talents, our best treasures in the service of and for the glory of the king, the one who delivered us from slavery. And if you do that, the assurance of Deuteronomy chapter 15 is, if you obey this command, you will be blessed. And the temptation is to think, well, how can I be sure? Well, I'll leave you with this. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, his one and only son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this very challenging lesson of forgiveness, of letting go, letting go of debts, letting go of what's owed to us, letting go of what we think is fair, letting go of what we prize, all in the pursuit of helping others, but also, and more importantly, glorifying you, showing that we trust you, showing that we depend on you, showing you that we understand that you ultimately are our provider our keeper. You who have delivered us from slavery to sin through the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. May you also help us to be people who can open our hands up and let things go. And in so doing, may we trust you for the blessings. We ask all this in your name.